it's been healed. Here comes the sound. Here comes the sound, and I say it's all right. Little darling, the smiles that came into their face. Little darling, it feels like years since it's been healed. Here comes the sun. Dun, 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 dun. Here comes the sun. Okay, we're going to get started in about uh, two minutes. This is a session on health inequities and social determinants of DOHAD. So please take your seats. Okay, Dr. Buta, please come to the... Why don't you come up? Um, I think people will come up one at a time. So. I think we'll get started. Um, our first presenter is Dr. Zulfi Karbuta. He's the founding director of the Center of Excellence in Women and Child Health and the Institute of Global Health and Development, um, the Aga Khan University, as well as the inaugural Robert Harding Chair in Global Child Health and co-director of Sick Kids Center for Global Child Health, Toronto, Canada. Dr. Buta leads a large research groups in Canada, Pakistan, and East Africa focused on scaling up evidence-based interventions in community settings and implementation of RMNCAHNN 
interventions, and perhaps we'll hear a little bit more about that in humanitarian contexts. Dr. Buddha is a fellow of the Royal Society, the 2021 IHME Root Prize recipient for significant contributions to women in child health research, and was recently awarded the John Dirks Canada Gardner 2022 Global Health Award, one of the most prestigious awards in global health. Welcome, Dr. Buta. Well, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. The topic that I've been asked to cover has been covered in great detail by the two plenary speakers this morning in the, in the Gaidner Symposium. And what I will try and do is to give you a perspective largely from the context of where contemporary challenges uh, um, occur, and there will be some overlap, but I'm going to try and give you my own personal perspective on where we stand in the context of social determinants of health and human development. Let me take you back to when we drew this infographic uh, some years ago when we were looking at global child survival. So this is about two decades ago, almost. And this infographic captures the real challenge that we faced with 10 million children deaths under five across the world. Each one of these dots is a cluster of 10,000 deaths. And as you can easily see, this is disproportionately clustered in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So South Asia appears as a red blob here, largely because of population density. This was one of the reasons why in the Millennium Development Goals, there was such an exceptional focus on women and children. And the two targets that we had for health in the MDGs, MDG 4 and 5, explicitly targeted a reduction in child mortality by two-thirds and maternal mortality by three-quarters. And if you look at the period between 1990 and 2015, actually the MDGs were signed in, 20, in the year 2000, we made phenomenal progress. Overall, for maternal mortality as well as for under five child mortality, we almost reached the MDG targets. The one thing that we left behind were newborn survival and particularly the early stage of life, where as you can see, progress was less than optimal. It was slower because this wasn't a global target per se. Today, as we speak in the context of global mortality change, what we are beginning to realize is that if you take the first 20 years of life, the zero to 20 framing as we normally do now for children, progress has been made in certain time periods such as under five children, but the more you go towards adolescence and school age populations, highlighted by some of these lower graphs, you will find that we have not been able to reduce some of those preventable deaths to the same extent as we have for under five children. So the figure of 10 million deaths, if you take into account the entire continuum of zero to 20, in 2020 still remains a huge challenge with around 9 million preventable deaths. These are figures that we've just published in The Lancet, just to put forward that the world may have made progress, but we are far away from an optimal situation of maternal and child health. Now why does equity matter? in this regards. If you take the MDG period, equity was largely ignored in the MDGs. The concept did not exist. And no one captured it better than Tony Lake, who within a few weeks of his taking over as the UNICEF executive director, made these remarks. And he said, if you look at these statistical national averages and our successes, they hide behind them tremendous moral and systemic failures. Failures because people have been left behind on the basis of geography, ethnicity, gender. And I sometimes find it a little difficult to explain to people as to what he meant by the fact that equity had been lost in the race to make a difference. Perhaps this is illustrated best by showing you an actual graphic with that change. So in this cartoon, what you have on the x-axis are countries that have reduced mortality with those that have done exceptionally well here, and those that have had an excess mortality. And on the y-axis, whether or not they did it by a demonstrable reduction in inequality or an increase in inequality. 
So the red cluster of countries are those that had quite a remarkable reduction in child mortality, but with widening gaps between the rich and the poor. And that is generally because people who have the earliest access to interventions and coverage in countries are typically those who are advantaged on the basis of geography, residence, power, money. And if you don't know it, you don't see it. We, in the countdown to 2015 and countdown to 2030 process, tried and tracked some of this progress through a very simple system of looking at country progress of intervention coverage, illustrated by this Manhattan plot. Now, on this plot are the median coverages of interventions across the life course for women and children. So starting off with pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, childbirth, postnatal, and, and the later period of early childhood. And on the Y, these gray dots that you see are countries. So immediately, without even doing any stats here, you can see that for many interventions, there are tremendous differences, even within the low and middle income countries that formed part of the countdown universe, in which countries were able to achieve. You could also look at it a little differently through a traffic light scheme. And if you look at the so-called composite coverage index of interventions that capture many aspects of family planning, antenatal care, child care, and immunizations, you find that some countries have made progress, some countries did not make progress. You see that through this traffic light scheme in terms of how countries did. But perhaps the greatest inequities that we all missed ourselves in the countdown process early on were the inequities within countries. So not only were the differences between countries remarkable, but the differences within countries. And some of these are highlighted here. This is Pakistan, my own country of origin. And each one of these dots here is now a district of the country. So you can see that the medians or averages hide behind them tremendous differentials. And without knowledge of those differentials, it is very difficult to target. And these facts and figures at times are also simplified in terms of what they represent. But they all have a story behind them. I'll try and illustrate mm -hmm. that in a, in a manner that hopefully makes sense as to why social determinants of health are so important. So we look at poverty as a big driver and as a big explainer of change. And as Cesar Victoria told you this morning, we look at poverty through either deciles or quintiles here, and we look at within country inequalities between the rich and the poor. Sometimes we look at double disaggregation by geography. But increasingly, we're looking at some of these differentials through the lens of geospatial inequalities, looking at various regions, geographies of the country, in terms of where are some of these inequalities manifest the most. So this is, again, Pakistan. This is the multidimensional poverty index for various districts of Pakistan. We drew this some years ago, and you can see that there are many parts of the country where if you just look at the MDPI, the figures are comparable, or in fact, even worse than parts of Africa. And there are other parts of the country where living standards may be comparable to what you see in upper middle income countries. And if you then try and overlap on this map as to what happens within health systems, and I'm just going to use one marker here that I'll use as an example, skill birth attendance at birth. There is almost a perfect homology between districts with the poorest MDPI indices and the poorest health services. So this is the inexorable link between social development, the multidimensional nature of poverty, care seeking and care provision. At the time when I did this for the first time, I hadn't quite understood some of those dimensions of poverty that we all talk about. And, and the person who captured it best, again, without being totally understood, was Mother Teresa, who when she was working amongst the poor in, in Calcutta made this poignant observation decades ago. And what she said at that time was that poverty was not just about being hungry or homeless, that it was about being unloved and uncared for and marginalized. And what she was alluding to was the nature of poverty that in health systems and in, practice, in normal practice, we don't quite capture. What do I mean by this? Let me give you one example. So this is from our demographic and health survey in Pakistan, looking at simple measures of antenatal care 
So here we have immunization rates, facility birth, and you can see there's a gradient between the poorest and the rich in the expected direction. In 2006, we asked one additional question in our DHS, which was added at our insistence, because we did not quite know what the figures were. And those simple questions to families were, did you actually put some money aside for childbirth, and did you even discuss with your husband the place of birth? Where were the childbirth going to take place? And the shocking finding was that in about a third of these uh, births, the husband and wife had not even bothered to discuss where the birth would take place. It was just taken for granted that it would take place at home or in their village. So this poverty of hope and poverty of imagination is one of the reasons why, ladies and gentlemen, that when you look consistently at data on where deaths take place in some of these settings, whether those be Africa or parts of Asia, we find consistently year after year that even though the health system is strong with these basic facilities at rural level and village level, when it comes to care seeking for problems, families, particularly poor families, vote with their feet. They either decide to stay where they are or they seek care in the upper end of the health system, sometimes many hours away. And the sickening distribution in verbal autopsies of places of death are that about half of these de deaths take place in domiciliary settings, about a third in the health system, and some while seeking care. Now, if you understand nothing but look at this graphic, it will tell you why it is so important to target interventions where the problem is clustered. You could build the world's best neonatal intensive care unit in some of these rural districts, but if people cannot access it and go, it will not make a difference. We need to go beyond mortality. So far I've been talking about deaths as one measure. It is the tip of the iceberg, but the iceberg is much bigger in terms of morbidity. And one such morbidity in the context of DOHAD and development origins of disease is being born small not being born small because you are premature only, but also because you are growth retarded. Some of this is related to maternal undernutrition. Other aspects are related to maternal disease, and often the combination of the two. To have placental complications related to preeclampsia coupled with undernutrition is the double whammy that many of these mothers have. And in numbers, these are huge. In our intergrowth project, we estimate that close to 23 million births annually are small for gestational age, about a fifth of all births in low and middle income countries. They matter because if you look at mortality and you look at that subgroup that I've just spoken about, being born small and early, the combination of the two, babies who are both preterm and small for gestational age, they have close to around a 25 to 30 folds higher risk of dying in the newborn period. And they also, as a group, account for about a third of all stunting in some regions and a fifth of all stunting globally. So that disadvantage earlier on in fetal growth because of maternal disease and maternal undernutrition is one of the biggest drivers of earlier linear growth retardation and stunting as we are beginning to find in much of our exemplars work. And these numbers are huge worldwide. There are about 150 million children worldwide who are stunted, whose growth is less than two standard deviations of their expected length for age. This matters because as we have shown in our most recent Lancet series just a few months ago, that if you look at drivers of development, intelligence, IQ, and schooling, this early linear growth deficit is one of the biggest drivers that we have of limited learning and learning deficit, and also school grade achievement. We also know that the converse protects, but the converse also, when it is abnormal, can lead to access risks of other complications. So if you have accelerated growth in childhood and development of overweight and obesity, the risk of metabolic syndrome, as we pointed out, is that much greater in later childhood and in adolescence. And this is a huge issue. This double burden of undernutrition and so-called overnutrition 
is a huge glo global challenge. And you can see this in this graphic that tells you how much change is taking place in low and middle income countries over time in just the growth of overweight and obesity in girls. These are data from our NIN's work looking at nutrition across childhood. And you can see this probably better if you were to see the exponential increase in some of these risks over time. Now, these are important. And as I turn towards what needs to be done, it's important to recognize that this is one of the big drivers that we believe in terms of long-term development, neurodevelopment, as well as metabolic risks. We've just published a week ago in The Lancet some of the first findings from our interbio work, which looked at fetal growth, well-documented and illustrated in terms of not only outcomes at birth, but also neurodevelopmental and growth outcomes at two years. And I'd urge you all to read it because I can't summarize this in the limited amount of time, but what you see on this graphic is very clearly fetal growth patterns that you can begin to club into certain areas. And they are also very closely matched, particularly those that are, are, are retarded and have the least rapid growth with pulsatility indices measured in utero. And the important thing to find are that there are metabolic signals which are both important to recognize for growth retardation and neurodevelopmental outcomes at two years of age. So you're beginning to find common overlapping metabolic signals which at the one hand protect and at the other hand place people at adverse risk of development. Now this morning, Cesar didn't have time to go into COVID, but I just wanted to highlight one thing with COVID, which really was a big interrupter in the context of child health and development, again related to what's happened to reproductive health and, and pregnancies. Our work in South Asia tells us that the disruption of schooling, particularly for young girls, girls who were in school, dropped out for two years, 15, 16 years of age and beyond, you can well estimate what happens if those girls end up where they would normally do in these circumstances without being in school. So we estimate that the rates of, of uh, child marriages and also adolescent pregnancies in the region have gone up within excess 450,000 adolescent pregnancies with all the consequences that you see in this particular graphic. And there are many consequences which are not captured in this slide, such as non-communicable diseases, et cetera. In terms of numbers, the numbers that we estimate, and that's why I was referring to how we want to bring in the ministries of finance, is that the global cost of these two and a half years or two years of lost schooling for children overall are in trillions of dollars and should never happen again. These are worse in conflict settings and emergencies and, and they require concerted action. So let me quickly finish by just giving you the main messages from our recent Lancet series on optimizing child health and development. So we looked at all of this in the context of the current challenges and in terms of the, the six actions that need to be taken. So the first is absolutely everyone has to have a life course perspective. And I think more than anyone, the ministries of planning and finance need to look at these investments as no longer just investments in children or in, in, in women. They need to be looked at uh, across the life course, the first 20 years of life. And then we need to recognize that there are effective interventions for each one of those components, which we, in the MDG period, largely restricted to under five, but they are effective interventions for school-age children and adolescents that need to be put in place. Then implementing them is not just a question of giving people money and what to do. There is implementation science and adaptive design of many systems that need to be put in place. We need to know how to do this, particularly around multi-sectoral investments. So what we are beginning to recognize from our work in stunting is that the drivers of change in many countries for stunting have been outside of health and nutrition. They've been in the social protection systems, the education systems for women's empowerment and the creation of of the environmental change that needs to happen. And that enabling environment, I completely concur with the sentiment, has to be supported by families and communities. And it needs to be managed by countries themselves. Donor assistance is important, but donor assistance is also a major stumbling block 
in the innovative and internal planning that needs to take place in countries as to how they want to see change in a nonpartisan manner that goes across governments and across the lifespan of politicians. It's important to recognize that for stunting, you're looking at interventions that if implemented today, would yield results perhaps in the tenure of another government 10, 15 years down the road. And unless you have that perspective, finding short-term gains is going to be very challenging. And lastly, all of this requires money, but money spent equitably. And that equitable investment needs to have a sustainable development goals framework and the nurturing support and care framework that we talked about this morning. So the five key elements of nurturing care, the importance of health, nutrition, safety, which is a safe environment, learning and importance of stable family relationships. Those are five principles that even though they may have been developed a few years ago for the under five children, are important across the life course. They are just as important for school-age children as we've learned during COVID and for adolescents as we've also seen underscored this morning. So if you recognize this graphic in terms of the guiding principles for investments in optimizing child health and development, this is what we need across the board, whether it's for high-income countries or low- and middle-income countries. Thank you very much for your attention. we're going to do is uh, just keep motoring through the, uh, the, in the uh, presentations and then we'll have questions uh, at the end. Thanks. All right, our next presenter is uh, Monica Ruiz Casares. Uh, she's just joined the School of Child and Youth Care at Toronto Metropolitan University. Moving on from Associate Professor of Psychiatry at McGill University and Staff Investigator at the Sherpa University Institute in Montreal, where she has, over more than a decade, evaluated health and social services for migrant and refugee families and other culturally diverse populations. A lawyer by training, she has several graduate degrees from Cornell University and the George Washington University and postdoctoral fellowships in social and cultural child psychiatry at McGill University. She leads mixed methods studies on child well-being and protection cross-culturally, mainly in the context of parent-child separation in low and middle income countries and ethical and methodological issues involved in research with and by young people. She's a member of the board of directors of the American Evaluation Association, co-chair of the International Society for Child Indicators, and a credentialed evaluator with the Canadian Evaluation Society. She's worked in policy and program evaluation of human services internationally for more than 25 years. Welcome, Professor Ruiz Casares. Thank you. Let me lower that significantly. Thank you, um, Lucy, for the introduction. And I want also to start by thanking uh, Negin uh, Samani, who's a master's student in, in our division at McGill, who's helped me put this together. Um, I'll start by acknowledging the diverse uh, Coast Salish peoples in this uh, territory where we're gathering with a commitment through this panel and the Congress at large 
to contribute to advancing equity for all children. So I'll start with a quote um, from one of, of the studies that I lead on child supervision cross-culturally and which reveals the importance of context in which many children are being raised and um, the, diff the difficult decisions, I will not say choices that families have to make to provide both the basic needs of children but also to keep them safe and to show care. So in this presentation, I'll quickly uh, talk about the scope of migration globally, then look at specifically at how uh, migrants are faring non-communicable diseases and what are some of the main risks and protective factors for healthy child development um, that are identified in the literature, and then conclude with some interventions uh, that research has shown that helps uh, the health outcomes of migrant children. All in all, the takeaway message, in case you need to leave early, is that migration status is an important determinant of health and immigrants are at a significant risk of suffering health inequities due to a number of non-medical conditions, um, social, economic um, structures and systems, such as poverty, stigma, and we'll see. I don't want to have a deficit model, so I'll also emphasize the strengths that, that immigrants bring in, but certainly want to make the, the case that in certain indicators, it interacts with gender, with ethnicity, and, and a number of other uh, determinants of health. All right, so according to the most recent World Migration Report, about 3.6% of the world's population, or about 281 million people, are migrants. The percentage of migrants varies enormously from one country to another. In Saudi Arabia, we have 38% of the population. It ranges, then you have about 29%, Australia, Oman, in Canada, about 21, 22% and it goes all the way down. You can see the, the light-colored countries that have less than 1%. The, in some, there are, as uh, Safir just mentioned, there's great variation within countries as well, and that's important to consider, particularly as we talk about policies, because the consequences of those policies in states, for instance, in the states, there are states where there's strong presence of migrants and others that are um, new destination states, but obviously the policy frameworks and the policy and programs that are uh, present are very different, um, and therefore so are the outcomes. About 10 to 15 percent of world migrants are estimated to be in an irregular situation, and I will refer some to undocumented migrants because that's uh, most of the work that I've done in Canada has been with undocumented migrants. But overall, just to give figures, you'll see there are huge figures besides the, the many million uh, international migrants. We have major remittances, so it's over $700 billion that are sent by migrants back home. And also different types of migrants, forcibly displaced people, internally displaced people, the number went up significantly with the war in Ukraine, but also protracted um, conflict and violence in other places. And also registered refugees with UNHCR, and almost five million asylum seekers are waiting for their claims to be uh, determined. In the US, big um, over time, uh, big increase in the number of migrants, and the same thing in Canada, particularly uh, if we look at the left-hand side for you, I guess that is, um, how the, the, um, the percentage and, and the, the total uh, number of migrants has increased over time, but also and, and it varies by province, um, but, but also the ages, that's the, the graph on the left-hand side, where we see that the largest group 2021 was the 20 to 24-year-old, um, but there are also a, a large number of young people, I mean, uh, adolescents and, and younger children who, who've made Canada home. Um, this increase is, it's not just something that happens in North America. Internationally, we see in Europe and in Asia, um, the number of international migrants has increased drastically. And a number of other indicators, and I uh, invite you to go to the um, IOM report to, to see the breakdowns, but just to, to put it in context. So um, if we, the panel is about social determinants of health, so I had to focus on those non-medical factors that are determined by social and, and uh, economic structures and systems and how those affect and the inequities that affect health. These are the conditions in which children and families um, live and work and age and grow. And so, as I said, the main takeaway message, I already give it away, 
um, and, and, and re, you know, rephrasing what, what uh, Heidi Castaneda and her colleagues did, immigration being socially determined and also a social determinant of health, how it's linked to social inequalities and social structures, which create a number of risks and limits often the choices that migrant families can make, and that connects to the initial quote that I started with. There is uh, the, sometimes it's the status of the children, but oftentimes it's the status of the parents that is gonna determine the help-seeking behavior of the parents vis-a-vis -vis the children. And that's what we have found repeatedly with undocumented migrants, both in the States and in Canada, whereas even if the children are US citizens or Canadian citizens because they've been born in our countries, the parents will be too afraid to seek services uh, because they don't wanna be uh, reported to the immigration authorities or or in any way, um, I'll come back uh, to the policies um, later, uh, jeopardize their chances of becoming uh, legal, legalizing their situation. So this graphic, um, uh, I think is a good summary for the, the interconnectedness and the complexity uh, of those pathways through which those social, structural, and economic factors affect the development and the health of immigrant children. Um, it was produced in the U.S. during the Trump administration, so some of the uh, examples, particularly for the policies at the top, are specific to that period. But I think that overall the categories hold because those um, sociopolitical, historical conditions influence the child's overall well-being and, and their physical and mental health. To this figure, I would just add, I don't know if it comes out, or will I hit continue, there is no, let me go back so if it picks up. Supposed to have, yeah, there it goes. I would just add the preconception, prenatal um, period, which has, as we just heard, a very important influence in fetal development and other uh, important determinants. Now this is just to illustrate that research with migrants is growing fast and there's accumulating evidence with immigrants in very diverse contexts, and that's why we picked some from different countries to show heightened uh, vulnerability to a range of non-communicable diseases, including, we can see, arthritis, diabetes, um, both in high and low, in, low income countries, you can see uh, a number of references, cancer, a work done with Syrian refugees in, in Turkey, uh, showing uh, they are presenting with higher, um, more advanced uh, metastatic uh, stages of metastatic disease, cardiovascular, mental illness, interesting, I'd come back to this when I present about the healthy immigrant effect, uh, whereas at the beginning we see the lower prevalence of contact disorders, um, ADHD, mood anxiety, in research done here in BC actually, um, but how that changes between first and second generation, and within 10 years, migrants catch up with the, with the natives and start uh, showing the, the poor indicators that you know, in mental health that we have um, locally. Obesity, we've heard about that, altered immune uh, responsiveness, and adverse birth outcomes, very important. So for instance, study in Turkey A, showing Syrian refugees, um, comparing to, to Turkish uh, women, having higher rates of adolescent birth and low birth weight in neonates, and also compared to Swedish women. So just to show research in very different contexts, showing that migrant women from in the case of the study that Liu did in, in, in Sweden, from Syria, for, from Iraq, from uh, Somalia, Eritrea, um, I think Afghanistan as well, um, had higher uh, chance, higher risks of, of poor, poor rated self um, health, but also gestational diabetes and stillbirths and, and uh, low, low birth weight. And of course, um, infant mortality, which uh, you know refugee women are more likely to have Partly, and that's what we have seen in, in pediatric hospitals in Montreal and in Toronto, because they're not follow, they don't have antenatal care, um, and so miscarriages, stillbirth, uh, were, are more common uh, among refugees than non-refugees. So there are a number of stressors and risk factors, and again, long list, and just to, to cramp a lot in one slide, I will not intend to go through everything, but you know, you can take a picture, look it up, or contact me later, and I'll be happy to pass on the results of our lit review. Uh, a number of, of stressors or risk factors that affect particularly new immigrants and refugees and make them more uh, predisposed to non-communicable diseases. 
poverty, I think we've heard it over and over, children of immigrants are disproportionately represented among those living in poverty, linked to underemployment, to disadvantages of the precarious immigration status, and also chronic uh, poverty being, as we know, particularly detrimental in early childhood, um, like, of course, like for non-immigrant children. We know uh, from Statistics Canada data that during COVID-19, uh, visible, so <laughs> visible minorities and immigrant families reported more severe challenges and concerns about un uh, unemployment, financial uh, issues, and uh, consequently um, also worse health outcomes. Food insecurity and housing insecurity, um, also major problems for immigrant families. Um, in uh, the, the systematic review that was um, that I list um, there, um, in refugee camps, the main issue was the physical housing conditions. But in receiving countries, there was an issue about affordability, the suitability of insecure tenure and mobility um, in in receiving in countries. Lack of uh, access to healthcare. I've already mentioned that connected to low health literacy limited language ability. We encounter that and we have a number of studies about the provision of services through interpreters in Quebec, and this is coming over and over, but also cost and some basic um, uh, uh, services such as transportation to be able to reach um, the healthcare services. Lack of educational attainment from the parents and also stigma and discrimination. So all the racism related stress which not only has an impact on uh, migrants more broadly, but also on subgroups of migrant groups, such as LGBTQ+, and, and um, racialized uh, migrants. Um, I mentioned earlier the healthy immigrant effect, or the immigrant paradox, which uh, refers to this finding that first-generation immigrants generally tend to have less chronic health problems and show more um, of a positive pattern of adaptation than nationals vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the nationals, but despite the, the poor, uh, sometimes poor living conditions that they have. But as I mentioned, the second generation oftentimes catches up, um, unfortunately. There are, there's also the bright side. So there are a number of protective factors and there are elements that support adaptation for instance, the presence of the social mobility ladder, and this refers to educational opportunities, and the studies in North America as well as with Arab refugees in the US and uh, in other countries, but also labor opportunities, like uh, the study that Wood and colleagues did um, in Australia uh, documented how meaningful employment, but also volunteering, ha can have a positive uh, beneficial effect on the physical and mental health and improved health uh, healthcare access and social integration of refugees. Neighborhood safety um, and inter-ethnic group relations are also important. Uh, in the study that Moise and, and colleagues did, it was a, a longitudinal survey and f with uh, Latino uh, immigrant families and found that high levels of ethnic identity were linked to a healthier diet, to higher levels of biculturalism, and with uh, other uh, beneficial health outcomes. So um, I want to have time to talk about the so what, so some, some solutions or some interventions that, that are yielding positive results. But I still wanted to, to present a, um, a, the positive, a positive youth development framework, which is growing and showing some promising use also as we work with migrant children, although there are only a few researchers, I think, in the last decade that are picking this up with this particular population, using the five Cs, the competence, confidence, character, uh, connection, and caring framework. The, uh, particularly from the work that uh, Moti Stefanidi and Mastin and others are doing, the importance of um, risk and resources that explain individual differences in immigrant youth and adaptation and mental health at the four levels of identities, I just um, talked about it, but also relationships in the schools and relationship with peers um, in the neighborhood 
and also the, the family relations and the difference, differences in the pace of acculturation of parents and children, which oftentimes results in mental health issues during adolescence when there's more conflict um, in terms of the parents uh, upholding the, the cultural norms of their country of origin, uh, which contrasts often with the one that the, the young people have adapted in the uh, receiving society. So um, some areas for action. Uh, it's clear that to make substantive improvements in immigrant health outcomes, it's important to treat, or that's what I'm advocating, treating immigration as a social determinant of health in its own right. Um, and this, of course, requires moving beyond interventions that look at specifically only the, the individual, so some individual behavior, to look at structural factors, social, economical, political, institutional structures that affect health, um, and, and such as healthcare practices, collaboration uh, with immigrant communities, as we've been hearing in the last couple of sessions, and a range of immigration and healthcare policies. So, all right. Um, so most of the current evidence about interventions with immigrant children uh, pertaining healthcare um, are mostly uh, connected to uh, quality of those services, costs um, in the areas of you see, um, dental, oral health, uh, weight, obesity, um, uh, healthcare access and use as we've, um, we're uh, um, advancing in, 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 uh, at Sherpa, I was gonna say at home, but it, because I'm transitioning, but let's say at Sherpa, where I've been for the last 16 years, I'm having an identity issue for a moment. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll illustrate one of the uh, programs that we have in Montreal that is based in our health and uh, social services um, connected center, it's La Maison Bleu, uh, which is a perinatal social care model um, and early childhood uh, development uh, services for vulnerable, so to speak, vulnerable, strong vulnerable families. Um, many of them are migrant uh, and newly arrived migrants or refugees. And for the, what we use is a comprehensive model that includes a, a physician, but also uh, psychosocial health care. Um, there's uh, nurses, there's a multidisciplinary team, a midwife, a, a social worker, psychoeducator, um, and a specialized educator. Uh, there, are four, there are four houses uh, in Montreal right now. They start in 2007, and there's accumulating evidence that shows uh, better health indicators in terms of birth weight and prematurity and so forth for, um, for the children that have uh, gone through the La Maison Bleu in comparison to the average Quebec estimates. If anybody's interested, happy to connect. And uh, specifically for mental health, since I'm in psychiatry, I figure I would focus specifically on mental health. Over the past decades, there have been uh, several interventions, and, and Vikram uh, presented this this morning globally, addressing uh, migrant children and families um, and the interventions at the individual, the family, and the community level. Um, most of the evidence comes from, from the individual level. There's not so much at the family level, although uh, slowly accumulating child-friendly spaces, um, and uh, the, the Latino, the Strong Latino Families uh, program. If I wanted to just, in the sake of time, because I've already gotten a warning, I'll just focus on the, uh, tr the intervention uh, developed by Dr. Cecile Rousseau, with whom I've been working for 16 years, and uh, in implemented by the Transcultural Psychiatry, uh, Transcultural Research and Intervention Team, based at McGill, uh, at the CUS. Uh, which is a resilience-oriented uh, psychosocial intervention, multimodal, I'd say, intervention in the schools in collaboration with teachers where teachers are trained, um, uh, work closely with the research team in co-conducting uh, sessions with children in the school uh, setting using different modes. So sound play for the little ones and um, storytelling for elementary school children and drama workshop with adolescents. There's been randomized trials and, and a number of evidence that has accumulated that shows a significant decrease in emotional and behavioral difficulties and significant improvement in children's self-esteem and in academic functioning. So my last slide before I get kicked out from the podium, um, just to put it in the context, in the macro uh, context, uh, and we heard it, we've heard it from Stan Kutcher and for 
as Peter Grotman and, and a number of people uh, yesterday and today, the need to be politically engaged and to promote and support um, public policies that set the ground for children to grow up healthy. So I'm not gonna you know, go through all of them, but most uh, migration-related policy um, implicates immigration policy um, enforcement and labor and, and, and trade and rarely education and health. And in fact, we need to look at, at all of those. So we need immigration reform, certainly, to facilitate access to citizenship and um, also to, to promote a, a more balanced and fair economic development globally so that people do not need to be, do, are not forced to leave their homes in the first place. So we really need to think that big. Um, and of course, coordinating all those policies. So we need to address the immigration as a social determinant of health to ensure healthy child indicators and equitable access to healthcare for migrants based on need without discrimination. Thank you. That's a terrific presentation, thank you. As you can see, we're moving from the big, big, big picture globally to something more at the sort of the, the middle layer level, I suppose. And our next presenter will be speaking sort of more about the, um, at the practice level. Um, Marjorie Rabiel is, a, is an associate professor and a colleague of mine in the School of Social Work at McGill University. She is a clinical psychologist and a couple and family therapist. And after uh, over 10 years of clinical practice, Dr. Rabiao is now a core faculty member for the MSc in applied, or applied MSc in couple and family therapy. Her expertise lies in working directly with children, adolescents, and their families using primarily a systemic lens. Her research interests include the development of identity within the context of family and community. Her current domains of study are the importance of working with the family when working with refugee youth, as well as when working with gender creative youth. She received the H. Noel Fieldhouse Award for Distinguished Teaching in 2020. Welcome, Professor Rabia. All right, thank you so much for the introduction, Lucy. Much appreciated. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I will be talking today about the intersectionality of social determinants of health. Um, I'm starting with what I'm gonna call a primer slide, kind of like what Monica was saying about what you need to remember from this talk. <laughs> so just remember this and then <laughs> Um, so the first one I'm thinking is already established, how significant social determinants of health are, the importance of it. Um, I want to talk about the fact that social determinants are not simply individual level um, variables. Uh, that's very important to me. Uh, they are also context dependent um, and they do not work in silos. They interact, they intersect and they interact. And I'm going to try to develop what, that, what I mean by that. Um, so first, I thought I would spend a few minutes to talk about my professional trajectory because it's pertinent, just, not just because I want to talk about myself. <laughs> um, so as Lucy was saying in my intro, I started as a child uh, and adolescent psycho psychologist in my training. Um, I did my internship almost 20 years ago now <laughs> in uh, child psychiatry. Um, and as I love working with children and adolescents, but very quickly I felt a frustration. I felt something important was missing. Um, so I decided to do a postdoc in couple and family therapy, and I felt like the systemic lens gave me so man many more tools to work with. Um, and then I did work in hospitals and in private practice with uh, children, youth, and families. Uh, and, and seven years ago, a new program started for training couple and family therapists. So I came back to academia. Um, and the program is hosted in the sort of School of Social Work, which is uh, why I'm there, and there's an important reason for that is because it also has a systemic lens, not in the family sense, just in the family sense, but a wider systemic lens of all the systems that are around the child, the family, the community, 
globally, uh, etc. Um, so I thought I would start by giving uh, an example to illustrate some of the things I want to talk about. So I'm going to talk about Sky. Uh, Sky was referred to me uh, as a five-year-old child, uh, referred to me for sadness. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more. But uh, Sky had a lot of symptoms of childhood depression. Um, and if I go back to, I don't know if I can go back to my previous slide, <laughs> this thing. but anyways, if I were to go back and I look at being a child psychologist, I would work with Sky, and I could work with Sky, and I have, uh, in terms of depression, depressive symptoms, I could have measures of depression and see if my intervention at the individual level would work. But the question I'm asking myself is, what would that data mean in terms of individual data points in a very decontextualized way? Because Sky has a story, Sky has a family, Sky has a community, and all these things are very important, not for the, just for the um, intervention level, but also to understanding the health, I mean, mental health, but health in general also. Um, so Sky uh, was expressing uh, gender fluidity at the time, um, was very adamant in wanting to uh, express gen gender in different ways, um, and so Sky has a family. Sky's parents were uh, immigrants from Latin America. They came from a very Catholic background. Um, and they were not sure how to handle the situation. And then they allowed Sky to uh, gender express whichever way they wanted at home. And so a completely different child, a very happy child. Um, but then they felt really at a loss of what to do. They felt very scared about society. So then, and a lot of my work, my clinical work and my supervision of my students now is working with family and parents. But the next level now is parents are telling us we want to support our child, but we're so scared. <laughs> we're scared of society. So now I feel like the work has to be done at the societal level. So I keep on moving. I don't know where I'm going to end up eventually. But, um, so I feel very strongly about the importance of the societal level. Um, just very briefly, um, I've mentioned quickly, but so I work at the Center for Research for, Ch for Children and, or on Children and Family with a bunch of my colleagues here. <laughs> um, and I'm part of two big uh, research teams, and for each team, I am the axis, which the research axis leader <laughs> in research, uh, and every time I'm representing the socio-ecological -ecolo axis. Um, so one of them is uh, research for on uh, trentis and families, and the other big, uh, so there, another very big team is Global Child McGill, and we're working with uh, refugee families, um, actually children affected by wars, and their families. So I will briefly uh, discuss a little bit the socio-ecological model. I think I've already <laughs> hinted towards that, but again, the idea that we're not, it's not just the individual, it's not just the child. Um, there is all the interpersonal around the child, the family, uh, the community, the organization, uh, the policies, the culture, um, and there are all kinds of levels, including political levels. There is so much research now showing the impact of laws and policy uh, let's say all the anti-LGBTQ plus laws that have very important impacts on mental health and actual health of individuals and children. Um, and I mean, I will keep talking about <laughs> the social determinants. I want to mention, I'll go back uh, about the importance of context. So for example, for Sky, um, the, the family actually came from a quite a high socioeconomic status uh, which in a way is a protective factor because of accessing services as uh, in Canada. But in their home country, actually, they came from a very prominent family and they felt a lot of pressure <laughs> in terms of going back and how could they let their child gender express with the family. They had to uphold certain standards. Anyway, so social determinants, the directionality of social determinants still depends on <laughs> where the person is at or which identity is being very salient depending on where they're at. 
Um, okay, so health inequalities are driven by systemic forces. I mean, I think I'm preaching to <laughs> choir, but anyways. Uh, so numerous studies affirm that health outcomes and disparities result not strictly or even primarily from individual behaviors or genetics, but from policies, structures, and systems that c circumscribe individual choices, access, and knowledge. Um, I think it's been brought up by a few speakers, but if we reflect on there is more and more research now showing the uh, differential impacts of the pandemic depending on social determinants. Um, so I think it's important to think about that. Um, I just wanted to mention um, when we talk about the, the rules, the policies, and I'm not only talking about legal and political, but also and at a, I don't know if it's a higher level, but at a social norm level, uh, the important impact. Um, so, the <laughs> for Sky, <laughs> who actually did, <laughs> is not five anymore, <laughs> and who's uh, grown up to be uh, identifying as a non-binary um, teen, as long as Sky feels that they need to fight for even proving their own existence <laughs> or their right to exist. Um, it's gonna be very difficult, very difficult as a psychologist, for example, to work at the individual level and have a significant impact on the mental health when there are so many important pressures coming from much higher up. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about minority strength and health. Um, I could list a lot of, <laughs> there, there is so much research and I was, trying to decide how much to put, but I think I just wanted to focus on, um, we have so much research now coming out on minority stress. And again, my specialty is mental health, but there is so much research on health. <laughs> it's not just mental health, it's on health. I mean, I think we all agree that <laughs> stress has a very important impact on health also. Um, so a bit what I was saying earlier, that the anti-LGBT uh, stigma and discrimination leads to minority stress. Uh, which leads to internalized stigma, uh, identity concealment, social isolation and loneliness, disenfranchisement, I don't know if I can pronounce that one, sorry. Disenfranchisement, <laughs> disenfranchisement, anyways, you, you know what I mean. Uh, impaired access to healthcare, uh, which leads to have adverse health effects, uh, including mental health effects. Um, and I wanna be careful also because I always try to, or want to use also a strength-based <laughs> lens and not a deficit-based lens. But at the end of the day, the data uh, are very strong in terms of for trans use, the suicidal uh, ideation and suicidal attempt rates are way higher um, than um, other youth. Um, and, but what's reassuring is that uh, there's a more, more and more research to show now that when the, with parental support, those rates lower a lot, so now we, need, we just need to work at the even higher level so that we can have um, the rates lower even more. Um, and what's important is the affirmative health care or clinical care, but at the end of the day, what's also very important is the inclusive uh, environment and inclusive clinical environment. Um, and like I was saying, as a clinician, I started working with the child and then with the families. And now I train my students to work with the families also. But because of the area we work in, it's, we're not just working with families. My students go to daycares. <laughs> as a therapist, <laughs> my students go to daycare, they go to schools uh, to advocate, to try to work at a more you know, community uh, level, uh, et cetera, or to do talks or to, um, to work ev at an even higher level. Um, so I think I said most of that. So the, the minority stress comes from external stressors and internal stressors. Um, and the internal stressors is often what we work on uh, in individual therapy or in family therapy. Um, and the, one of the points I wanted to make um, in the contextual part uh, is when we talk about minority, it's in comparison to <laughs> another group. <laughs> so we, and Lucy was saying I work a lot on identity, but 
we, ha we all carry a bunch of identities with us, and each identity becomes a lot more salient depending on the environment you're in. So for example, since I got to the conference, every time I speak, somebody asks me, are you from Montreal? <laughs> and I'm like, oh yes, I'm Francophone, <laughs> which is not something I always think about, but <laughs> here in Vancouver, I feel that's a very salient identity for me. It's not necessarily, maybe it adds a bit to the stress, I'm not sure. <laughs> But anyways, so but I, it's, this is very important because depending on the group you're in or who's around you, it's going to affect you differently um, in terms of the saliency of that particular identity or the minority stress. Um, I think that's mostly what I wanted to say here. Um, anyways, so just the, identi the idea that context matters. Context matters for intervention. Context matters for research. Um, context matters for data, <laughs> so it's something to, because it, it's it's hard to keep data not decontextualized. Um, so there are many, many, many uh, determinants of health, and I think the, this is why I put it in my title, um, the the importance for me of the intersectionality of the social determinants. And I was I was saying at the beginning that they don't work in silos, and they interact and intersect. Um, and there are all kinds of bodies of research also, also uh, about the intersectionality um, and, and the importance for health. Um, so intersectionality refers to the complex interplay between systems of oppression. And I do want to be careful here because <laughs> I am a psychologist and I, I work a lot with identity. Um, but uh, a lot of the research, and actually uh, some very good articles recently came out from psychologists to say that um, the appropriation <laughs> in the psychological field of intersectionality actually re uh, sometimes removes the importance of, it's talking about actual systems of oppression. It's not just about identities intersect intersecting, but that the identities bring the minority stress potentially, um, and with each one of them comes different systems of oppression and the interaction can be exponential depending on the situation. Um, okay, so I just want to mention briefly, um, so these are the three key approaches I bring to my research, my research teams, uh, my writing. Um, so the socio-ecological perspective focused on family and community uh, the importance of culture and context, uh, and the inter intersectional lens to account for complex uh, power relations. So I've developed in a number of my chapters and articles these concepts, and as I was saying at the beginning, because I'm part of those two research teams, it's often in the context of either transfers and families or uh, children, children and families affected by war. So I think I will, oh, five minutes, okay, <laughs> good. Shamelessly, do I have time to plug my book? <laughs> I will shamelessly plug a book that's coming out, yes, finally. <laughs> uh, I've learned through COVID that uh, publication is uh, a lot slower with COVID. <laughs> Anyways, so it's a book, it's uh, about the, our research on war affect ch ch children and families, but I, did, I just wanted to point uh, more specifically to one of the chapters that I, I wrote um, and it's really the idea of taking the time to stop and maybe we need to unlearn and deconstruct certain things that we've been taught at different levels through very early on <laughs> in our lives. Um, so this chapter is about unlearning and deconstruct to collab collaboratively rebuild a sense of collective well-being around children, in this case affected by war, but it's really the, the theory can be applied to any situation. Um, so this is a big question. <laughs> I'm not necessarily expecting answers, but these are questions I ask myself often. Uh, can research methods, also because I teach research, research methods, <laughs> I'm teaching Thursday research methods, <laughs> uh, can research methods grounded in positivistic epi epistemologies effectively address oppressive system and social conditions as they are themselves rooted in oppressive and inequitable structures? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. um, so very briefly, um, I, will, I just wanted to make sh mention critical theory as a way to try to answer some 
that, or that question. Uh, so they need to acknowledge the extent to which the way knowledge is valued and understood maintains and exacerbates health inequities. Very briefly mentioned, <laughs> our Munich theory uh, that posits meaning making as a fundamental aspects of social ecological realities and their health impacts. Um, and some of those questions, some of them I've kind of asked already, but are decontextualized data valid? What, what are we missing with the decontextualized data? can help be assessed apart from understanding the diverse ways in which it is experienced, or social cultural norms and subjective experiences separable from health behaviors and outcomes. Uh, and learning deconstruct, while our collective assumptions, practices, and expertise in public health are typically assets, they become liabilities when they obscure the very questions necessary for transformative change. One last slide. <laughs> okay, uh, which needs to. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm not going to go into details, um, but this is kind of a summary of some of the things uh, I've been talking about, I've been thinking about, about the things that might be actually keeping health inequalities um, from being addressed, including the way we do research, the way publications, the way tenure work, you know, all these things that maybe we need to think about. Um, as I said, <laughs> um, this is what you need to remember. Um, and just one last slide, uh, so that in terms of the fact that it's multifaceted. So we need to be careful not to use social determinants to categorize, decontext decontextualize, and generalize, and therefore invisibilize the complexity of the human experience and health of children and families. So um, we now have about, uh, I guess, about 15 minutes for question uh, period. Uh, so I invite the audience members to come up to the microphone and uh, pose your questions. Um, I guess, is there, where's the microphone, Marjorie, that you had? Oh, okay. Maybe you can. And perhaps you could direct your questions at uh, in the specific panelists. Thank you. This isn't on, is it? Yeah, it is. Okay bit closer. My name is Sherissa Smith. I'm a PhD student from Rotterdam, the Netherlands, Erasmus NC. And my question is for Professor Buta and Professor Ruiz Casares. I was wondering how you view, um, well, how do, how do I say it? The, the need for care ex as experienced by the people who we have talked about. So in the Netherlands we do a lot of research also in inequity because especially in Rotterdam we know that the difference is very large between people with a high socioeconomic status and people with a low socioeconomic status. But um, access to healthcare is very good. So we have the problem that there seems to be a problem in the need for health healthcare or the perceived need for healthcare by the people who need it most actually. So what we try to do is scaffold the health agency and uh, yeah, try to, to s make them see why they need the care. But it's so difficult because we also have to, do, to deal with adaptive preferences. You only compare yourself to that which you think is manageable for you and a reachable goal because otherwise you are very frustrated continuously by the thing you cannot reach. So this is a barrier which is very difficult for us to overcome, and I just wonder how you both view this matter. So thank you. I mean, that, that's a great question, and it's a very important question internationally. So addressing inequities requires a combination of looking at both push and pull factors. And actually, Cesar alluded to some of those push factors that countries have. They relate to conditional cash transfers, for example, for alleviating specific pockets of poverty related to issues that require money as a solution. Removing user fees in, in many uh, organizations. Uh, creating incentives through voucher schemes. Or unconditional cash transfers in many places. In, in many instances now, cash transfers are also being done with a gender lens. 
in, in Pakistan, we have a program which is only focused on female heads of households. And that cash transfer program was one of the major reasons why post, why, why post COVID, we did not have a huge economic impact. On the other hand, there has got to be also the receptivity at the level of the health system with friendly services, which people are akin to, adre uh, to, to access if they want to. So that's why you have frequently the conversation around respectful care. Uh, you can have uh, all kinds of incentives encouraging people to go and seek care in immunization centers, in antenatal care clinics, but if they go there, if they go there and they're abused or treated with disrespect, and that's very much related to the presentation that we had on the perceived, the lived experience of migrants and marginalized populations. While we talk about those in the context of high income settings and, and others, in many countries, the people who are marginalized are many times part of indigenous minorities, tribal populations, people who are living in urban slums. For them, the lived experience of accessing care where they have care provided both with compassion and in, at times with services of need is very important. So those, that's the pull factor from, from the health system. And, and the last thing that I would say is that for health services in particular, uh, if I had time, I would have gone into this. One of the best innovations over the last several decades is uh, what we call uh, principally um, um, uh, not, uh, you know, outsourcing care or uh, uh, transfer of care to other cadres, but kind of managed care, which is shared care through community health workers. Community health workers are where there are no physicians. So decades ago, when David Saunders and colleagues you know, wrote the book, Where There Is No Doctor, they were talking about the real rural remote populations. But we see this under our very nose in urban settings where people don't have access to physicians and other cadres of worker, or where they have mixed health systems where people have to pay for that transaction. Yeah. So there, the role of community health workers has been exceptional in regions Africa, Asia, South Asia in particular, where they are part of the public care system. And they provide a lot of the preventive care, particularly for women, children, and adolescents. They're very important parts of the immunization systems. And they've helped bridge the gap. And my last point on this is there has to be political will to do it. The political will on the part of leaders, and that's what I alluded to this morning by saying ministries of, ministers of finance are guided by prime ministers and presidents where people have zero hunger policies, where they have an explicit role and reason to reduce inequities and gaps, you will see change. Where it remains in the hands of a few professionals and has absolutely no link to party manifestos, it doesn't happen. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was quite a good answer, so I don't have a lot to um, add, but a couple of points, and we've heard it over and over, there's no bullet, um, like gold solution for every, everything, every context. So the top down, the bottom up need to work, so, you know, at the same time. Um, but one thing is when you were saying, we have healthcare access, so maybe universal healthcare, right? But the fact that the services are there doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be used. Those are two different things. And one of the things I think I passed fast, I put it in one slide, but I'm not sure I commented on, is the importance of working with the communities, like really figuring out what, why is it they're not being used. Um, a lot of the work that we do with both the service providers and with the communities, um, the uh, migrant different ethnocultural communities, reveals lots of biases and attitudes um, that we were not aware of. For instance, we found that it's very important to work with the administrative staff in the hospitals when, you know, when the, the families arrive. It's not only working with the medical doctors or with the social workers. Before they get there, the first filtering happens through the secretary when you hand in your paperwork. So, and that was just, you know, doing a large survey and figuring out what were their attitudes towards access to healthcare for undocumented migrants or refugee families. So working with the providers, but also with the communities to find out how can it be 
culturally sensitive and appropriate um, in many contexts is not only an issue of language. Um, we ha I mentioned we have at least three or four studies during COVID on how to provide services through interpreters in times of a health crisis. And we're finding we're really not equipped um, quite to do it that way. Um, sometimes it's lack of the technology um, and which oftentimes the families were not comfortable with, just you know, doing this Zoom thing was not doing it. But also, what is it to work through interpreters who are not properly trained? You cannot count on just a family member translating for you. I mean, there are lots of ethical issues as well as uh, training uh, issues that come into play. So those are the two points that I, that I would add to Sophia's answer, which was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Is that mic working or no? Hello. Hi, my name is Shania. I'm a Global Health PhD student at McMaster, and my question is in relation to considering the cultural backgrounds that influence how health is promoted in the households in every community. Uh, we, I work with a team at McMaster. Our community-based project is called SCORE, and we're focusing on how newly immigrated children in a low-income neighborhood have access to healthy active living interventions. Essentially, we want to create a program to reduce the rates of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Um, because there's a range of families from different backgrounds, we're finding there's no one-size-fits-all intervention. And so I know we talked about working with communities, but if, if any of the three panelists have recommendations on how to promote health literacy among families that are newly immigrated to the area, or if you've seen tools used, um, I'd be happy to hear any of your recommendations. Okay, so um, I'm gonna build more probably in the work that I do in low and middle income countries than I do in Canada, but also the work that we do in park extension, which is an area in Montreal that has a very strong South Asian particular presence, but not only. Um, uh, the, and there was a, a reference earlier uh, in a previous panel about the time it takes to do this kind of work. So build those relationships with community groups. Uh, we've gone to seek temples. We've gone to, to go to the places where families go, um, get the authorities and the, you know, to, to be on board and to identify what's the best space to meet the families where they are. In mental health, the first thing you don't do is you say you're doing anything connected to mental health because there's a lot of stigma around it. So you generally start by sharing a meal and then the conversation leads to this and that. So a lot of what I, you know, what we have, I have found, and I said that, but it's also working in Laos and Namibia and all the places where I work, is have your local allies listen, then listen <laughs> to what they say, and then find, find uh, the entry point through, you know, that, that is culturally appropriate. And generally, I think that a bottom up, and in my case, because I work with children, is involve young people from the start. Not later on, it's not an afterthought. You're not giving them anything. You're, you're building it together. That's what, but I'm, I'll be happy to share the resources we have on, on our end. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Having one last question? Yeah, we can take another question for sure. Well, thank you. I'm going to ask a very brief question. My name is Somdat Mahabir from the National Cancer Institute, and my question is for the second speaker. I was very intrigued by your topic, but you didn't show any data, so I'm going to ask very quickly. Um, I thought you were getting at uh, health disparities type of things. Um, <clears throat> in terms of, uh, you know, immigrant populations, is there any, any um, any comparative uh, evidence, any comparative data? For example, you have shown several health outcomes. I'm thinking um, uh, maybe you can talk about whether you're going to do these type of things in the future, but is there any evidence that, um, and, and again, it's kind of contextual and time, that immigrant populations for, for say, things something like obesity or cancer have higher rates, say, compared to other underserved populations in, in maybe in Canada? Um, thank you for the question. And the, because it was a summary of a lead review, then there's no specific data. It's kind of summarized. Um, in some cases, there were meta-analysis, in some cases, systematic reviews, in some cases, just specific studies. Uh, and there is, there are quite a few studies in different contexts, um, high-income and low-income countries that compare the native-born 
with um, different immigrant groups, oftentimes are refugee, uh, for instance, Syrian refugees in Lebanon or in Jordan or like specific groups of the population. Of course, there was no time to show the limitations of many of these studies. Uh, they're not always um, uh, you know, representative or generalizable to the whole population. So in some cases, the evidence is more solid than in others, uh, certainly. Um, but the pointers are there that there seems to be a disadvantage in some of these indicators in se several contexts. And so the, in our review, we found uh, evidence from both high income and low income countries, but just for the sake of plugging everything in slides, um, put some references in high and low so that we see, number one, that migration is not just a phenomenon, because oftentimes when we're here, we think we're just receiving refugees or whatever, but most of the immigrants are actually in, yeah. in the Sahara. I do, I'm sorry I'm interrupting, and I know yes. time. I, I didn't mean, uh, you know, that macro level. Yeah. I'm thinking right in a country like Canada. You have yeah. different racial, ethnic groups, and things yes. like that. Those type of comparisons. Yes, there are comparisons, yes. Okay, well, thank you. Absolutely, yes. I'm happy to continue conversation with you. Great. Yes, thank you. All right, do we have time for one more question? We've got uh, a minute, two minutes. Thank you, it's gonna be a short question. Uh, hi, my name is Agnes Erge and I'm working at the South Africa Medical Research Council. Um, and I was wondering about, we talked a lot about how so social determinants of health and interventions and addressing these are very uh, multi-sectoral and require um, all these different sectors to work together and um, the interventions uh, themselves have um, costs and benefits for all across the sectors. But most often than not, we measure this uh, in silos, let's say just the health sector, and we often underinvest in interventions um, because we only show the benefits for one sector. So what does this mean um, for the way we do research and, and whether there are any uh, successful great examples for co-financing mechanisms for these kind of interventions that can be an example for, uh, for other countries um, that are planning to implement multi-sector interventions? Thank you. Is there anybody in particular that you're addressing your question to, um, or just in, in general to the panelists? Uh, in, in general, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Anybody want to take that? <laughs> in a minute or less? 38, 38 seconds, seconds, actually. <laughs> there are examples, and you would probably find them in the literature of um, nutrition interventions in general, rather than uh, early child development interventions. So. Talk to me in the break right afterwards, and I'll point you to where some of this is summarized in recent meta-analyses, summaries, and exemplars, you know, which have looked at multi-sector investments over time. For example, for stunting, we know countries that have done exceptionally well, but almost none of them had a stunting program. But if you di dissect out as to what were the drivers of change for stunting reduction in Peru and Brazil and elsewhere, you will find that they were multi-sectoral actions that were put in place to reduce inequities that had an inevitable and a very strong impact on reducing nutrition disparities. So 30 years on, we can all you know, look at that and say, great investment. But it was really not targeted investment for one particular benefit. It was for multi-sectoral benefits across reduction of poverty, disparities, WASH benefits, employment, reduction of food insecurity. All of those combined and then just to give you one final bullet point, it turns out that for reduction in stunting as one uh, global target, about 50 to 60% of the impact across these exemplar countries came from sectors outside of health and nutrition. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to thank the audience. You've been awesome in participating, asking great questions. Also would like to express my gratitude to the speakers. Thank you.
Cause he seems like he's good